Okay guys, we'll get started. Good afternoon. So my name is Jessie and today we've been talking about mega projects and I want to focus on, if you can't tell by my tunnelling photos, rail infrastructure. Um, but spe specifically, uh, I'm going to be talking about complexity. So we had a taste of this this morning, um, if you were at the keynote speaker. So complexity and risk management. But first, a little bit about me. Uh, so if you asked me about a year ago what Project Controls was, I would not have been like able to answer you. I could have thrown a few like words out there, but now I can at least tell you what the controllable parts of a project are and what the uncontrollable parts of a project are. It might not be a textbook answer, but I am learning. Uh, so in June last year, I joined HKA and I've been on secondment to Sydney Metro for about a year and a half, um, predominantly working in the risk space, so across six of the Greenfield City stations. And I've learnt that risk is a lot about asking the right questions so you can enable the decision makers to come to the right answers. So to get us awake, it's the afternoon, I've got a little video just to catalyze our thinking about the role of the risk manager. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats, don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle, holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. That's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at this face, they just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, yeah. you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like a no world. Look, I don't know who EDS is, but I wasn't lying when I said that I wanted to catalyze your thinking this morning. So, all this afternoon, my bad. Um, so basically, what that kind of shows us is that the role of the risk manager is to be bringing order to chaos. And I think as project controls professionals, we need to be navigating complexity. Um, but the question is how? So as you can see here today, I want us to go on a journey of reframing. So um, I guess, I'm going to take stock of what we see, but I want to move into a place where we are thinking about how we need to see. So it's worth mentioning, I'm not trying to dismiss or dismantle existing risk practice. I'm just asking us to think about how we might align and adapt how we work to the reality of complexity on mega projects today. Uh, so the question really, oh, sorry. <laughs> The question is, do the risk solutions that we have enable us to test and treat the sensitivities in the system, the mega projects that we operate on? So to begin, uh, we need to take stock of the existing state of risk practice. So what you're looking at is the industry known brand ways of working in the risk space. Um, so these are usually focusing on controllable elements of uncertainty. Risk is about uncertainty. Um, we're looking at what we can mitigate. See, these traditional ways of working, they are assuming an environment of certainty and stability and control. So, if the real world is anything like cowboys herding cats, then we need to ask if our risk solutions is acknowledging a reality or a perceived state. So this is what we're looking at on the screen. So on the left, we're looking at these assumptions and these brand name methodologies, um, which are relying on this consistency. And then the challenge is whether our solutions are aligning to what we're actually seeing, which is this emerging change and this complexity. So we need to be looking at the drivers of complexity on our mega projects today. So Firstly, what we see in mega projects is that they are vulnerable to entropy. So what I mean by that is that as a mega project goes on, we see a decline, a gradual decline into disorder. So you see the issue is emerging as you're moving from design into construction and you're seeing your risk registers, things being realized. So 
Um, this makes a mega project infamous for its completion, or rather its lack of. So the examples that I've used in my paper um, was Sydney Light Rail um, and Crossrail. Now, I'm not using these as examples of failed mega projects, but merely mega projects where we've got these publicised, promised dates of completion, um, where there has been cost and time overruns, and some of these are yet to be known. Now, in the case of Sydney Light Rail, these time costs were capped at 7.5 million. Um, on Crossrail, the cost overruns are still yet to be known. So these are just some ones in the public eye. Um, if you guys are familiar with the work of Bent Flyberg, he is looking into this mega project space. He's done a lot of research. He's a professor from Oxford. Um, he's a guru, and I started looking into his research, which is how I wrote my paper. Um, and he looked and scrutinized this transport trend of cost overrun. And there's one study in Denmark um, that sampled 258 uh, mega projects concluding that two out of ten uh, are underestimated. Now it's worth noting that this is actually data from 2003 and arguably what we're seeing in Australia, I mean I don't even know if we have currently ten rail mega projects, we might, um, but this might be a conservative ratio. So I was really curious about this trend of underestimation, so in my paper I was asking whether there's scope to be arguing that complexity underestimation is driving our cost and time pressures on mega projects. So what we're seeing is these emerging changes and these sensitivities in a system, what we're looking at on the right of the screen there, along with these drivers of complexity are putting some pressure on the degree of control that we can have on our mega projects. So as project controls professionals, we are best positioned to be scrutinizing this trend of underestimation because we encompass the people, the processes, and the systems which are delivering against cost, time, and scope. So we need to move from what we see to how we need to see. So to be treating these sensitivities in a systems means we need to understand the interconnected and interdependent nature of the nodes in a system. So this is systems thinking. This is where we're mapping and we're making sense of the interconnectedness. Now it's worth noting that in the NAO audit of Crossrail, um, there was a plan which outlined the critical path. It was presented, but the plan this is what the NAO audit said. It did not adequately reflect the interdependencies across the program. So the question then is how can we adequately map the interdependencies? So according to those at the end of the project life cycle, so those in claims and disputes resolution, which my company HKA worldwide they do claims and disputes, um, they've made a case in the HKA's crux report for the case of underestimating causation complexity. I was really curious about this, I looked into it, and this is where the illusion of control can obscure the interconnectedness between issues. I'll just give you a little moment to take in some of the complexity here. So as this systems map suggests that we don't want to be obscuring the interconnectedness between these issues. Just as a schedule needs to be determining the critical path, as risk managers we need to be understanding the interconnectedness of the issues on a project. So this is where the complexity, the consequences may arise anywhere within these webs. Um, so what we're looking at here in yellow, you're looking at causation mapping from claims and disputes data across 257 projects. These are the primary and secondary causes of disputes on mega projects, and the maximum amount of causes on any one project was 39. In green, you're seeing the causations which were noted in NAO audit of Crossrail um, for cost overrun on Crossrail. So I just want to note, I know that claims and cost overruns are not synonymous, but arguably they both have an undesirable consequence for our mega projects. So. If we're looking at this systems map, what we're seeing is we don't want to be underestimating the causation complexity. And we also realise that we can't just be looking at cause. So another management professor, Detmer, he's specialised in systems thinking. He says that the more connections or links that there are in a system, the greater the chance of variability or even of system breakdown. 
So this is fitting with what we're seeing in terms of the mega project being vulnerable to entropy. It fits with the uh, case of Crossrail and the interdependencies, and it also fits with uh, the causation complexity data that we just looked at. So the key takeaway is then that uh, it's not going to be a lone item on a risk register that's going to lead to an undesirable consequence. It's going to be the combined effect of interdependent and interconnected issues that are going to compound to have a significant impact. So in light of these findings, what we need to consult is a framework for complexity. Now, if you were at the keynote speaker, his presentation this morning, he also spoke about, he said it differently though, I say sinophon, I think I'm saying it wrong, he said kinephon, the kinephon framework. So thankfully, a framework for complexity already exists. Oh, shivers. Oh, there we go, here we go. Just wanted some suspense for you. So there's four different types of systems and what we're seeing here is that they actually exist on a spectrum of order. So on the right in the simple and complicated domains what you're looking at is these systems more conducive to uh, traditional risk methods. They are cause and effect relationships. Um, however, the unordered and unexpected nature of the relationships and connectedness we're seeing on our mega projects. We're seeing uh, physical interfaces, we're seeing councils, community groups, we're seeing new consortiums on the market, we are seeing um, ISDs, so integrated station developments on our metros. What we're seeing is that there's no linear relationships here. So this is pointing to a need for our risk solutions to be aligning more to a complex system. And it's worth noting, if you're looking at the little yellow highlights there, is that that actually means moving from analysis, which underpins our QRAs, our quantitative risk analysis, and our SRAs, our scheduled risk analysis. It means moving from our analysis to probing. So this is where we're going to understand the complexity of the interconnectedness and the interdependencies before we move into a place of responding. Now here, I want to talk a little bit about that movement from analysis. So this is a visual contrast of the two scientific paradigms um, of analysis and synthesis now. Analysis is the traditional method. It's where we are understanding a system by breaking it down into its parts. And synthesis is the reverse. So we're trying to understand the whole by looking at the relations of parts. So the subtlety here is that analysis can lead to compartmentalizing. So you're seeing down the bottom there, there's more work there's more analysis. Um, this on a metro would look like having station silos. It would look like there's different allocations of risk, um, different delivery strategies. Um, and what we're seeing then um, is this is where the illusion of control can obscure the interconnectedness. What we then need to do to avoid this is to move from conclusions to connections. So as a risk manager, the more connections that we are making, the more we're bringing together the different parts of the whole, the different parts of the mega project. So this is where we're ensuring that the internal and external sensitivities within the system aren't being overlooked. And this is where we are favoring our completeness and control and our collaboration. This is where risk registers is going to speak to our change and our cost, and it's where our interfaces are going to be speaking a language of integration. So you may have heard it said that a system is said to be the sum of its parts. So what we need to first be doing is identifying the parts. We then need to un understand the relationship between those parts, and then we can move into a place where we can probe and then find those missing parts. So all of this said, uh, you may have noticed I've use this concept of completeness in control. So as project controls professional, professionals, can we actually control complexity? Um, arguably, we need a foundation for probing and to deal with the uncontrollable and unpredictable parts of a project, we need to understand what we can control and what we can predict. So on a mega project, we do see the need for control mechanisms, otherwise we would not all be here today. Um, we need to be managing our cost, our time and our scope. Um, so today, what I want to do is focus on two things. I've called complexity to consistency and categorization by causation, and these are a bit more tangible for you in terms of how you might operate in the risk space on a mega project specifically for rail, um, just because that's my experience. So um, complexity to consistency. So this is where if we have uncertainty and inconsistency and they collide, our risk consequences are more likely to be realized. So 
we want our people, our processes and our systems to be speaking the same language. Otherwise, inconsistency is inevitable. Um, so an example on a metro would mean that on all of the stations, you'd have the same structure, the same language, so that if someone outside of their own station package was to then look at the risk register of another package, they would straight away be able to navigate that complexity without any context. Um, the reason we would do this is so we can look at the mega project as a whole. Um, and this is just one way we could have a foundation for probing. The next uh, control mechanism is categorization by causation. So the first one there, risk breakdown structure, is my personal favorite. Um, this is where we're going to be identifying the disciplinary streams, the different functions on our mega project. And this isn't to create the silo effect that we saw in our little pyramid before, um, but it's actually rather so we can go deeper into some of the issues. So we'd be breaking down what are the commercial procurement contractual risks, what are the design risks, what are the government uh, planning approval risks, what are our interface uh, risks, third parties, utilities, what are the technical commissioning, engineering risks. Um, we'd be looking at all the different elements and we want to go deeper there so we can go wider. We want to understand the intricacies of those issues. Um, I really feel like this is how we enhance the visibility. It's how we're connecting the whole, it's how we're encouraging accountability and it's preventing those gap risks. Um, the other way there I've got is the two-pronged model. So this is where if there's unnecessary uncertainty, if we don't have a clear delineation of contingency, um, we're going to be at risk as a mega project. So um, in the two-pronged model, what you're doing is you're centralizing and you're assessing the data, not by cause, but by consequence. So you're enabling the decision makers to be looking at the degree of impact. What it would look like on a metro, for instance, is you might have station-specific risks and they would sit within the package. But maybe you have project-wide pressures, maybe you have station-wide common risks. Maybe you can hold them then at the first prong, which would be project level, and then the decision makers can be prior prioritizing those, and there might be able to be shared controls that can be rolled out so just for consistency across. Um, this is an elevation process, and this is really um, one that I think we need. Um, as you're seeing here, these little black boxes are the danger if we don't do these things, if we don't have these control mechanisms. Um, we need some degree of them. Uh, there's one um, blog that I was reading and he's looking at managing complexity, looking at risk, and he was saying that the tendency for mega projects is to be looking at these external threats, these physical interfaces, um, while failing to detect the internal vulnerabilities that we have on a project, um, which may cause us to break down. Um, so these sensitivities could be localized parts of the complexity, which we easily overlook, which can result in these gap risks. So um, we need to then think about what it looks like to be probing. Um, and so if we're in a risk review, if I ask a delivery director, what keeps you up at night? His answer is going to be analysing the present state of the mega projects. He's going to be thinking about what's his cause for concern in this moment. And the mitigations that we're going to be putting in place will be reactive. Um, it's analysing the present. So how do we then look at the future? How do we look at cause and effect, cause and cause in a new way? Given causation complexity, we need to be thinking about consequence. So this means we need to probe the past, the present and the future. We need to proactively understand the patterns, the dynamics, the relationships. But the question is how? So we're going to go on a little thought experiment, um, an example of how we might do this. If I was to have a risk review and if we were to be working towards an operating railway first passenger service on day one, we would be beginning with the end in mind. That's our outcome. So we'd be working backwards, right to left. We're working backwards to understand what are all the possible causation points, what are all the pain points for all of the parties, all of the stations, any part of the mega project, what are they thinking about along the whole line against the schedule, all the different things that could go wrong. What you then need to do is understand the behaviours, the connections between all of these. It's looking at worst case scenarios. It's looking at ignorance mapping. These are some concepts from design thinking, which I have more of a background in and sci like systems thinking. Um, so it's kind of asking this question of how can we transform the way that we do risk reviews rather than just having Excel spreadsheets? What if we had everyone in a room and we were mapping on the screen 
on the wall with post-it notes, the whole project timeline and all of the risks so we can visualize them. We could even digitize them with the tools that we have today. I'm imagining a time change situation in my head. Um, but we want to be facilitating this as risk managers. I believe that we are positioned to be able to do this. No one else has that cross project um, ability. Just going to rip that. Um, but this takes us to the future proofing of risk practice. And as someone new to the field, what I want to be asking you guys is what is our disciplinary mitigation to retain the relevance of risk management into the future? I want us to be thinking about the next generation of risk managers. So I think maybe there's possibility for earlier intervention in terms of how we introduce complexity mapping, maybe in our uh, business cases. There might be, as I was saying, a way that we could transform our risk reviews. Um, there's a few options and in my paper I really <laughs> scratched the surface, um, but I guess I wanted to encourage you guys as an audience, put it to you, how are you going to connect the dots, how are you going to future-proof risk practice and change the way that you work. So this is the journey of reframing that we have been on today. Um, so looking, I guess, at what we are seeing and perhaps how you might need to see and think differently. Um, so as someone who may or may not be a future risk manager in the future, I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll hand it over to the floor. Don't be shy. I'll give you post-it notes and we'll put it on the wall. <laughs> Thank you. That was mind-blowing and I don't know about the rest of you but I think I'd like you to just do that one more time. <laughs> so that we can follow it from end to end. So, yeah, you were putting the question back to us, but what kind of tools can we look for in the future? You've, you've stated some, some things that we've probably never thought of before. What should we be doing to start future-proofing risk? Mm, I love that. Yeah, it's good to start thinking about it now, and I think that's what we need to do. So that's why I guess I was encouraging us to think differently about how we work and how we might work. And I guess the challenge I found in this presentation, but also in my paper, was coming up with that next step, those things we could do or what it would look like. Um, what I kind of landed on was that it starts with thinking differently um, and testing the waters and challenging others and the way that we work. And I don't think it's going to be one person who will have the risk solutions. So I think we need to work together and collaborate, um, which might be where we have that completeness and control. Um, yeah. So again, it comes back to what we heard in the keynote. It's about people and relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> how, do, how do you see a different level, different type of thinking into construction Yeah, no, it is a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if everyone in the room knows. I didn't study anything relevant to this at all. <laughs> I um, did a double degree in creative writing and creative intelligence and innovation. So I guess the takeaway from that is uh, there's this concept of a T-shaped learner. So in that creative intelligence and innovation space, what we're looking at is 24 different ways of thinking, 24 different degrees in one, and then you have one degree, which is where you specialise. And so it's a T-shaped learner where you come with a broad skill set and a way of thinking and transcending one traditional field and one traditional methodology. And you can bring your core discipline to that space, and that enables you to really go into any field. 
and to bring forward all these different ways of thinking and approaching challenges. So that's kind of how I landed in this space because I was interested in innovation and I could see there was potential for innovation um, in this industry and somehow made it into the risk space. And I can see that there is opportunity in risk and risk isn't just in the negative sense, it's in the positive sense. So I think that's where maybe there's a relationship between innovation and risk and value management, all of the buzzwords, yeah. Does that answer your question? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the answers, but maybe it's not about having answers. Maybe it's about asking questions of each other. Yeah, how we can diversify. I've got a very booming voice, so I probably don't need this either. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that um, some employee, employer in a couple of years' time is going to be really happy to have you. You're a very impressive young lady. <laughs> and I'm an old person, but if I had a child, I'd like her to be just like you. You're a very impressive young girl. <laughs> well done. Thank you. On that note... Thank you, guys. <laughs>